Just like how this Russian bulletproof vest is a lie, everything else about the Russian military should be taken with a large grain of salt. While the vest looks solid, it certainly doesn't hold up when it's put to the real test. But why believe what a YouTube channel is telling you, when you can hear about systematic lies and corruption within the Russian military straight from primetime Russian national TV? In a rare outburst on November 11th, Vladimir Solovyo, a prominent anchor on the state-owned Russian One TV channel, did not hold back, talking about the lies that the Russian military has been hiding behind from the bottom to the very top. This included deceptions about what actually is in Russian inventories, the true state of the military equipment and the number of troops they actually have on the front lines. Now let me say that without a doubt, the Russian army still got a serious punch. But at the same time, it's not the army that we are led to believe, especially when you see the many examples that point to their lack of might. Some may call what we're about to present anecdotal evidence, but we'll let you be the judge of the true state of the second best military in the world. But how the Russo-Ukrainian war itself may have possibly been a direct result of systematic lying that is entrenched within the Russian government is not what you think. Let's start with the biggest lie of all. The Russians are liberating historical Russian lands from Ukraine's Nazi regime, the so-called denazification and demilitarization. The city of Kherson was the only administrative center that Russia managed to capture during their 2022 invasion, which they later annexed and declared it Russian forever. They even put posters all over the city proclaiming that Russia is here forever. Ironically, that didn't last long, because on November 11th, the Russian army was forced by Ukrainians to retreat to the east bank of the Dnipro River. As the Ukrainian forces entered Kherson, they were welcomed by the cheering Ukrainian population. Scenes like this quickly turned the Russian referendum narrative upside down, as it was claimed that 87% of the Kherson population voted in favor of joining Russia. Clearly not. Not only Kherson was taken back by Ukraine, but also many Russian telegram channels became disillusioned. Even back in March of 2022, when Russia invaded Kherson, the local population greeted the aggressors not with flowers and Russian flags, but with Ukrainian colors as they yelled at the Russians to go home. The Russian Ministry of Defense proclaimed that 100% of its troops and equipment were successfully relocated to the other side of the river without leaving anything behind. I must admit, this does look quite organized, the way Russians stripped off their gear and swam naked across the river. As one might expect, Russian TV portrays everything about the Russian military in the best possible way. So why don't we balance it out? Where and what the Russian soldiers ate was great. In reality though, many were given food rations with expiry dates in 2015. This is how Russian soldiers do their laundry, although in reality, they were using washing machines that were stolen from Ukrainian homes. When Russia declared a partial mobilization back in September, it became evident that the one and a half million uniforms Russia had bought and ordered years ago existed only on paper. That's why Russia advised their mobilized men to buy their own clothes and gear, as otherwise they would risk receiving shoes of different sizes or some that date back to the 1940s or possibly nothing at all. The Russian military can't even supply soldiers with enough socks, never mind helmets or bulletproof vests. Even the infamous Russian terrorist Igor Strelkov frequently runs crowdfunding campaigns on his Telegram channel for basic equipment like shoes. Speaking of helmets, there are multiple examples of what looks like a helmet, but in reality, it's not. I don't even know what to call this, but this is definitely not a combat helmet. In some instances, Russians have been caught wearing 1950s helmets, which were repackaged with modern covers. In other instances, the helmets appear to be made out of plastic. Going back to the bulletproof vests, 
you will be lucky to have got one which has some kind of metal plate instead of cardboard or foam. When it comes to the sizes of the vests, yet again, you get what you get. There is other evidence that points to the lack of basic equipment for the Russian troops, like the fact that they have ordered uniforms from Belarus and Iran, as well as numerous crowdfunding campaigns which supply Russian soldiers with uniforms, helmets, vests, and so on. When it comes to weapons, the situation isn't much better. The harsh reality is that Russia cannot provide its troops with enough quality weapons outside of the TV shoots. While Russians have a lot of Soviet Kalashnikov automatic rifles, their condition is poor, as you can see. But it gets worse. During training, mobilized men have to use mock weapons, because simply they don't have enough real ones. Jumping to the battlefield, Ukrainians have found Russian troops using rusty and antiquated weapons. For example, this Mosin Nagant rifle, which dates back to 1891. Yes, it is still used in Russia, but only as a ceremonial weapon. The shortage of guns on the battlefield meant that the century-old rifle made it to the Ukrainian battlefield. This is actually supposed to be a decoy. And why pick on a decoy when the drones are not much more impressive? Russian TV often shows videos of Ohotnik stealth drones, but they're not even in production yet. What is in production is Orlan 10, arguably the most effective Russian reconnaissance drone with a price tag of about $100,000. But what's interesting is what's inside these drones. The drones that were shot down surprised Ukrainians because they're equipped with consumer-grade point-and-shoot cameras like Canon and Sony. Additionally, the funnel for the fuel was made from a plastic soda bottle. And of course, the electronics inside were all Western-made. That is some Russian manufacturing. On paper, Russia has over 10,000 tanks, but most of them are in reserve, and the chances are most will not even start. It was estimated that at the beginning of the war, Russia had just over 3,300 operational tanks. Fast forward to today, and Russia has lost nearly 1,500 tanks based on visual confirmation. So Russians had no other choice but to pull the T-62 out of storage, the ones that actually could be started. Since T-62s were produced in the 1960s, it makes you wonder what kind of condition these 60-year-old tanks were kept in. But wait! How about Russia's newest main battle tank, the infamous T-14 Armata? And that's a fair question. Let's just say that in 2015, during the parade preparations in Red Square, one Armata stalled. The commentator on the live broadcast said that it was a planned demonstration of towing military equipment. That's a first. In the end, Russia decided not to mass-produce T-14s, citing that the tank was too costly. Instead, they produce a limited number of T-14s and modernized older Soviet tanks. When it comes to the Russian Air Force, just like with the tanks, it looks great on paper. They have just over 1,100 fixed-wing fighter and attack jets. But here's the thing, most of the aircraft are under-maintained, so some of them fall down to earth even without Ukrainian help. In the recent months, multiple aircraft have been lost due to equipment malfunction even before they made it to Ukrainian battlefields. But worse, according to Western intelligence, it is very likely that Russia has more aircraft than they have pilots, because training pilots is quite expensive. Russian pilots receive a fraction of flight time every year compared to their NATO counterparts. According to British intelligence, Russian air combat training was heavily scripted and designed to impress senior officials. The budget that was supposed to go toward proper training and development of Russia's own navigation systems, such as GLONASS, which is basically a Russian GPS, must have ended up somewhere else. Because among the wreckage of Russian airplanes, Ukrainians frequently found consumer-grade GPS receivers such as Garmin, or even smartphones, which Russian pilots would have had to use due to the poor quality of Russia's own navigation systems. Yes, Russian pilots would tape commercial GPS receivers to their dashboard. 
Of course, when this embarrassment became evident, the Russian Ministry of Defense started blurring the cockpit dashboard to avoid further criticism. Then there is the Russian aircraft carrier, Admiral Kuznetsov, which is not an aircraft carrier. It is classified as a heavy aircraft cruiser, otherwise she wouldn't be able to pass through the Turkish Straits due to the Montreux Convention. Nevertheless, this carrier scares everybody, not only environmentalists, for obvious reasons, but also the pilots and crew on board the ship. Admiral Kuznetsov is so reliable that it has to be accompanied by a tugboat. More often than not, the carrier's propulsion systems break down in the middle of the sea, forcing it to be towed to the nearest port. Admiral Kuznetsov is currently in the dry dock, where among other things, its propulsion systems are being replaced. When it comes to Russian missiles, not only do they rely on Western electronics, they are also far less accurate than we are led to believe. In a recent review, the U.S. Naval Institute concluded that Russia's claims regarding their missile accuracy were exaggerated. Russians advertised an accuracy of a few meters, but the reality was more like 30 to 50 meters. In addition, Western intelligence suggests that Russian missiles suffered up to 60% failure rate during the early days of the Ukraine war, which makes Russian missiles sound like Russian roulette. Seriously, numerous Russian missiles have refused to fly to foreign territories and just wanted to come back home. To be fair, Ukrainian missiles sometimes also appear to go off course, as happened on November 15th when they ended up in Poland, killing two civilians. Another Russian tech with exaggerated performance is the S-400 air defense system, which was proclaimed by the manufacturer to be capable of intercepting HIMARS artillery rockets. But as you can see, that is clearly not the case. To be fair, the S-400 is still among the most capable air defense systems in the world today, but is clearly not as capable as it's often perceived to be. Even according to Igor Strelkov, the S-400 is not effective against large HIMARS attacks. Let's switch gears to Ukrainian forces for a minute. No one imagined that Ukrainian forces could stand against an invasion from Russia, similar to what happened with Crimea in 2014. Obviously, the Western help made all the difference in 2022, and it's hard to imagine Ukrainian forces having the level of success that they've had without the US and NATO. But even without all the external help, there is a key difference between Ukrainian soldiers and Russian troops. Ukrainians know what they are fighting for. And the same cannot be said for Russians. The Russian military is currently in the same state as the Ukrainian forces were back in 2014. Let me explain. Even though the Russian annual military budget is about one-tenth that of the US military, Russia still spent over one trillion dollars over the past 15 years. One trillion dollars is a lot of money, but where did that money go? A big chunk of the money went to the Russian Navy. Russia built two Admiral Gorchkov-class frigates, each costing $450 million. They also built three Admiral Grigorovich-class frigates, with a unit cost of $430 million. Russia additionally paid $250 million for each of its seven brand new corvettes, plus another $160 million for each of its two brand new landing ships. But at the same time, Russian oligarchs with close ties to President Putin began building their own fleet. The fleet of mega yachts. Let me just mention a few. Here is businessman Alisha Rusmanov's Delbar mega yacht. This is the former Russian governor, Roman Abramovich's Eclipse. And this one is former deputy chairman Igor Sechin's Amore Viero. While over the past 15 years, Russia spent $3.2 billion building new warships, President Putin's oligarchs spent just over $4.1 billion building their own mega yachts. But these mega yachts are just the tip of the iceberg. Yachts are just large enough for everyone to notice, but the amount of money that has been stolen from Russia's military and non-military budgets is enormous. 
The systematic corruption is the reason why Russian troops were receiving explosive charges that had wood in them instead of TNT. This corruption is why the reactive armor on Russian tanks was filled with rubber instead of explosive charges. This is why Russians never properly invested into the communication equipment and got stuck using old Soviet radios and even Chinese walkie-talkies. This is Sergei Pugachev, a former close friend of Vladimir Putin. During countless live streams, he has shared his stories of what it was like being part of President Putin's inner circle. He claims that even during the Soviet Union times, in the late 80s, everyone in the Soviet and consequently Russian military believed that there would never be a war. As long as there was nuclear deterrence, some kind of a balance would be maintained, meaning that conventional wars were not needed. According to Pugachev, President Putin never prepared for this war because fighting a war in Ukraine was basically impossible. What I mean by that is that the guiding principle and primary belief of the Russian military officers was that as long as there is nuclear balance, a conventional war would never be needed. And why would they believe otherwise? After all, Russia marched into Crimea in 2014 and just claimed the lands with no repercussions. So if there's never going to be a war, why invest in it? Why put money into stockpiles of helmets, weapons and bulletproof vests when they would never be used? Nobody in the Russian military envisioned the scale of the war that they are now seeing in Ukraine. So the budget was simply stolen and went toward mega yachts, dachas and other luxuries. But if President Putin didn't want a war and was never prepared for it, why did he start a war with Ukraine? Well, he didn't. He started a special military operation where the Russian army was expected to walk into the Ukrainian capital with minimal resistance, where paid Russian supporters would greet the troops with flowers and Russian flags. Both Russian propaganda and even Belarusian president claimed on TV that Ukraine will be taken in a matter of days. Even Americans originally gave Ukraine less than 96 hours and even offered to evacuate President Zelensky, to which he famously replied, The fight is here. I need a munition, not a ride. I guess comedians are not always funny. Over the past several years, President Putin poured billions of dollars into people like the Ukrainian oligarch Viktor Mitvichuk was supposed to organize pro-Russian movements all over Ukraine. And that's where the real irony lies. The money that was supposed to sponsor pro-Russian movements across Ukraine was stolen, the same way that the Russian military budget was. According to Pugachev, Russia has spent tens of billions of dollars financing the former member of Ukrainian parliament, Viktor Medvedchuk, the former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, and more, during the past decades. President Putin was under the impression that the people whom he was paying to establish a pro-Russian movement were doing their jobs, preparing Ukraine for a takeover. After all, President Putin's only trusted source of information is his inner circle, some of whom were getting paid by him. Of course, those people were giving him the thumbs up. It's all good. We are ready to become part of Russia, just like Crimea bring in the troops. The scary part is that the culture of lies within the Russian media, military and government was so strong that it appears even people in charge started believing their own lies that they could take over Ukraine in a matter of days. Even the West fell victim to Russian lies. In February of 2022, President Putin ordered his troops into Ukraine, where Russian soldiers were greeted by Ukrainians, not with flowers and Russian flags, but with in-laws and javelins. The rest is history. And speaking of history, this is the Tsar Bell, which was made by order of the Russian Empress Anna Ioannovna in 1730. The bell was made so people would remember her rule. Mind you, it was never used as an actual bell. This is the Tsar Cannon, which was made in 1586 by order of the Russian Tsar Fyodor Yovanovich in his recognition, although it was never fired a single time. 
This is the launch of the Russian hypersonic glide vehicle Avangard, which can carry both nuclear and conventional payloads. Traveling at speeds of up to Mach 27, Russia claims that Avangard can change its speed and direction in order to outmaneuver missile defense systems, something that ballistic missiles cannot do. Russia claims that it would take at least 50 SM-3 missiles to shoot down one Avangard glide vehicle. This is the Russian Poseidon nuclear torpedo, which Russia alleges can travel at a speed of up to 100 knots at a depth of 3,280 feet and has an unlimited range. Poseidon can deliver a nuclear warhead with a yield of up to 100 megatons, suggesting that if detonated near the shores of the UK, it would produce a tsunami 1,600 feet tall, which would submerge the entire UK under radioactive water. This is the stuff that they show on Russian national TV. If you ask me, Avangard and Poseidon are going to have a similar fate as the cannon and the bell. After all, President Putin said it himself in an interview. We're not planning to fight a war with anyone. Our goal is to create a perception so nobody thinks to fight us. And this is why the Russian military is not what you think.